What's up everybody, Big Herc Fresh out. We got another dope interview for you. We're kicking it here with the homie, Matt V. And he's gonna tell his story, he's got a hell of a story. So I'm gonna let him take it over and talk about where he's from and what he's about. Matt V, so what's up, man? What's up, man? So, uh, Good to be with you. Yeah, I'm glad you were able to do this interview with us. So, you know, tell us a little bit about your background, like, you know, where you're from, how you grew up, and, you know, um, you know what, you, what you were about. Okay, so I grew up uh, mostly in the Inland Empire, which is uh, a little bit east of uh, Los Angeles County in um, Rialto. So I grew up mostly in Rialto and um, just got into general uh, teenage shenanigans, whatever, you know, uh, hanging out with bad people, trying to steal sometimes or do drugs and, uh, you know, drinking from time to time, hanging out with bad people, all this kind of stuff, right? And um, there came a point in my teen years where hanging around with such a crowd that I felt like, you know, I needed to have weapons on me where I carried a gun or carried a knife on me all the time, you know, feeling paranoia. And so I would, you know, all the time I would just have like a gun on me, a gun in my car, something like that, right? And so one day I was working at a Del Taco, working in the drive-thru, and some guy came up into the drive-thru, and uh, kind of as a side note, I don't know if people know this, but when you go to the drive-thru, you know, it says, oh, hey, welcome to wherever, McDonald's. Would you like to try this and that, right? A lot of times that's a recording, okay? It's, it's important. And um, so the guy, this is at Del Taco, the guy came up in the drive-thru and he said, oh, welcome to Del Taco, would you like to try, you know, this burrito or whatever, right? And so he started to order, but it was a recording. It wasn't my voice, right? And so when I said, oh, can you hold on? He was like, well, wait a minute, you know, you just said, I heard the voice on the recording saying, go ahead and order, and now you're telling me to hold on. So there's the discrepancy. And so he got upset, right, immediately. And so we started to argue about that and um, just kind of bickered back and forth. And then I was like, I tried to apologize, and I was like, you know, I'll just be with you in a second, right? So when I was ready, I got back on the thing, and I was like, um, all right, go ahead, order when you're ready. And then a female voice came on, who I later found out was his wife, right? And so she ordered like normal. And then uh, they end up pulling up to the, <coughs> to the drive through window. As soon as they pull up to the drive through window, I see, you know, the dude uh, in the van. And then uh, I guess his, where I found out was his wife sitting next to him. And immediately we get back into arguing. You know, he's like, oh, you know, why did you say go ahead and order when you, when you weren't ready, this and that? And I try to explain to him, hey, it's a recording, all this kind of stuff, right? So we bicker back and forth and it starts to get elevated, like starting to yell at each other. And finally he says, well, why don't you come outside and do something about it, right? And so I'm like, all right, you know, you challenge me. And so... I exited, you know, our little area to go outside and I walk around the building and I had a 25 on me at the time. And so I pulled out the 25 and I walked like in front of his vehicle, like, you know, what's up now? You know, you challenged me. What are you going to do? Right. And so at that point, he just like looking at me like he's seen a ghost. You know, he didn't expect I don't know if he thought we were going to fight or whatever. He didn't expect me to have a gun, you know. And um, he like freezes up. And then that's when I see his wife, you know, sitting in the passenger seat. She, she, she like turns around. And she's like, oh, kids, get down. He has a gun. That's when I realized he had kids in the car. You know, I didn't know that. So anyhow, he's so panicked, he puts his car in reverse in the drive-thru and, like, backs out. And it's, like, curved. And so he backs out to the drive-thru and he just takes off or whatever, right? So at that point, um, I'm going, I go around to get in my car and leave because I know someone's going to call the police or whatever, right? And uh, sure enough, someone calls the police. And as I'm leaving, they, like, pass me right up. The police passed me right up and uh, they didn't even see me. So I go on the street and I, and I take off and I'm thinking, where am I going to go? You know, what am I going to do with these guns that I have and all this kind of stuff, right? And so I go to a couple of my homies' houses and um, I tell them what happened. And I'm like, I need to get rid of this stuff, these guns or whatever. A couple people are like, oh, I don't want to deal with it, this and that. Finally, I end up at someone's house. And um, at the time, this is uh, in the year 2000, mind you, right? So my pager is going on. And uh, it's my house paging me, you know, 911, and it's, it's my dad. And I call him on the phone. He's like, hey, the police are here. They are want to know, you know, what's going on. They say that you're a shoot to kill this and that because, you know, I have a gun flash around in public or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And uh, he's like, just please turn yourself in, right? So we go back and forth. I'm like, you know, I don't want to turn myself in or anything like that. And um, finally, you know, I get to the point. I'm like, all right, you know, I'll turn myself in. But... And he's like, okay. And so, like, I hang up the phone with him. And um, I tell my friends, all right, well, I need you guys to get the gun stuff out of the car. And I got to tell him where the car's at because it's my cousin's car. I want them to impound or whatever so he can get his car back, right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, whatever. And then from there, I go to the police station. And I just, you know, basically with my hands up. And I turn myself in. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm here. You know, this is what happened or whatever. And they're like, okay. They asked me where the car was at. I told them where the car was at. Thinking the guns would be gone out of the car. Sure enough, they weren't. My friends didn't take anything out of the car, whether they were scared or whatever, right? 
So they found the guns, everything, and so all of a sudden, you know, I'm locked up and I got this slew of charges. You know, they charged me with uh, uh, assault with the firearm, uh, personal use of the firearm. They charged me with child endangerment because the kids are in the car. Mm. Uh, they charged me with uh, possession of a uh, uh, explosive device in certain areas because they found M80s in my car. All those kinds of things, right? And so I start going to trial, start trying to fight it. You know, they give me a public uh, defender, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, they're trying to offer you this many years. You're looking at, you know, however many, 20, 30 years or whatever, max, max time, you know? And so I'm fighting it. And um, I end up taking a, a plea deal, a plea bargain for seven years, you know, avoid going to trial. I take a plea bargain mm -hmm. for seven years, you know, subsequently, you know, I do that at 85%, you know, um, when you go to, to prison, if people don't know, you generally don't do 100% of your time. They give you like say seven years with fifty percent or you know eighty five percent. So you said you, you rather than go to trial, you went ahead and took the deal for seven years. So mm -hmm. what what happened after that? Okay, well you know leading up to that, you know my my whole time in um, county jail, and I was in West Valley Detention Center in San Bernardino. You know, that's their county jail, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but I, you know my total stay there in county jail was about six months while I'm sitting here fighting the case, and a lot of stuff happened, right? Okay, one of the first things major that happened while I was there. Um, I had been to a uh, juvenile hall before, you know, I've been locked up, arrested, all that kind of stuff before. And so I kind of knew the rules a little bit, you know, of like the inmate rules of what you're supposed to do, you know. Um, and California prisons is very segregated, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's blacks, you know, Hispanics and whites and stuff like that. And so uh, you're not supposed to trade with certain people or, you know, eat with certain people, this and that. For example, um, if you're part of the Hispanic car, you know, Southsiders, you're not supposed to basically interact at all with black people you know you can't shower with them you can't eat at the same tables with them all these kinds of things and I, I had a general idea of this but not fully obviously because of what happened so it was one day there's this uh, tall thin black dude he's about my age I was 18 at the time it was in 2000 I was 18 at the time and um, you know when they give you the prison uh, outfits they don't always totally conform to your body it could be too big too small this and that right well his was too small he was a tall guy and it didn't fit him totally right and mine was a little bit longer so he was like hey do you mind if we trade pants i thought nothing of it i was like sure you know i gave him the longer pants he gave me the short you know everything's fine right about an hour or so later i'm sitting on my bunk and this big old mexican dude bigger than me i'm five foot eleven six foot you know comes up to me and just right in my face and he said that's for trading with the blacks just totally just drops me one right in the face you know and um you know, I'm surprised. I didn't know what the heck was going on. And um, someone ended up coming to me and be like, hey, you know, these are what the rules extend to. It's not that you don't just sit at the table with black people or shower with them. There's no dealings with them, you know. And so no trading food with them, no trading clothes with them, nothing like that, you know. And so that was kind of my first foray into, you know, the realization of, hey, this is a whole different place. These are the rules of this place, you know. And um, kind of as a side note, it's kind of messed up you know if you go into prison or jail or whatever and you're not any kind of races or you know have anything against another race it's kind of messed up that it'll potentially make you that way you know they enforce the rules so much like in that case mm -hmm. i mean you think you're doing <clears throat> something that's innocuous and you know you get in, in trouble for it or checked as they call it. they call mm -hmm. that being uh, checked you know uh it's like a warning it's like these are the rules you broke the rules this is a warning you know mm -hmm. and um so that was my my first lesson into you know the realities of jail so anyhow, uh, that happened and, you know, I had a big old bruise on my face, right? And, and the, that also taught me a second thing. It's like, okay, you have this bruise on the face. The, the guards are going to see it, the deputies, right? So you got to tell them a story. You can't just tell them, obviously, that uh, you got hit by another inmate. That's telling, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And so was, I had to come up with a story. Oh, I fell while I was in the shower. You know, that's the story. You're in the shower. You fell down. That's how you yeah. busted your eye. And, you know, so, that, you know, that's what I started the. To tell the cops you have to tell i have to tell my family when i'm on the phone because they listen to your phone calls you know the the cops mm -hmm. you know you get on the phone in jail the cops are secretly listening and so you can't say oh yeah you know so and so hit me because that's equally telling you know a lot of people at home might not know that so anyhow basically i had to keep this hush hush this is just what happened i had to deal with it and go on my way so anyhow i continue to fight my case and you know i'm in county jail and um the next thing that happened that was big you know was I was in this, I think I was in another housing unit and um, two black dudes got in a fight on their own. Nothing to do with uh, the Hispanics or the whites or anything like that. They got in a fight on their own, but they didn't get caught. They got in a fight and the cops didn't find out, right? But they saw one of the dudes had like a black eye or something like that. 
And so they were trying to investigate, hey, you know, what happened? You know, who is this guy fighting with? Nobody would tell anything, right? And so they got upset. They were like, okay, if, if no one's going to tell us who you're fighting with, then we're going to come in later tonight and, you know, toss the whole place up. They call it, you know, search all the bunks and mm-hmm. stuff like that, right? And so sure enough, nobody told anything. And then in the middle of the night, 12 o'clock or whatever, they come, <coughs> the, the deputy sheriffs come in just full force with all their gear on, like the right gear, and, and they start, you know, tossing bunks. Hey, you get up this and that, right? And shove us all to the walls. And, and um, as standard protocol, if people don't know, when you're in jail and they start to do something like that, the, like the first thing they do is strip you down. They're like, take all your clothes off, get mm-hmm. naked. You know, it's a full search. It's not just reaching in your pockets. It's, you know, take all your clothes off, bend over and squat, all this kind of stuff, right? And so that's how it was. They threw us against the walls and they're shouting all kinds of stuff. And for whatever reason, I don't know if I didn't hear a command or something, but this guard got really mad at me and he like grabbed my wrist and my back like that and slammed me head first into a table like this, chin first, and it busted my tooth. I don't mm. know if, if you can zoom in, but I have a chipped tooth in my front. So it slammed my, my head, chin first on the table, freaking, you know, blood everywhere and everything. Just messed me up. I don't know, like I said, if he thought that I wasn't paying attention or whatever. So anyhow, I'm all messed up in a daze now and they uh, end up tying me up like hog tying me and take me into like where the visiting room is you know uh i don't know why but they take me in there and just continue to like just kick me and like stomp on my back and this and that while you're hog tied well i'm hog tied yeah i don't know just setting the example just for not following assuming you didn't follow command right the the main thing was they're mad because they couldn't find out something about what happened with the incident earlier and so they had to take it out on somebody Mm -hmm. and i just so happy to be the person right and then to add insult to injury it's like I'm the, the, the prov- uh, provocator or whatever. I was the one who did something wrong. <laughs> and so now I had to go to the hole for the next five days. Yeah. You know, solitary confinement. You know, oh, no, you must have done something wrong. So now we got to send you to the hole for five days. <laughs> so I spent the next you know, week or so in solitary confinement for you know, something that I totally hadn't done. You know, busted lip, all this kind of stuff, or tooth and everything. You know? And um, that, you know, uh, when I went to the hole, you know, that was my first experience into solitary confinement. Uh, beforehand, I was in dorm living. And um, in prison, there's basically two different settings. There's dorm living, where it's just a bunch of bunks in like a, a gymnasium type of area. And the second thing is uh, cell living, where it's a bunch of like individual bathroom type mm-hmm. size places, you know. And I, so I was in dorm living at that time. But when you go into the hole, you know, administrative segregation, um, it's just totally solitary confinement. It's just you and nobody else in it. So I'm in the hole. You know, like I said, this is my, my, my first foray into solitary confinement. Totally different. You're in a, a cell by yourself, stripped of everything. You know, on um, mainline, when you're in the general population, you might have things like TV and, you know, there's tables where you can play cards and things like that. But in solitary confinement, you know, there's none of that. It's just you. Maybe they give you a book, a Bible, or something like that. And, um, that's my first experience also into hard, hard time. You know, um, one of the things I want to mention is a bit of a side note is one of the things I don't like about prison movies is oftentimes they display it as prison is just violent, violent, violent all the time. It's like every day is somebody getting stabbed or killed or beat up, you know. And the reality is it's not like that. I mean, those things do happen, but... Um, like I said, the incident with me happens. Okay, that happened on one day. But the next five days, you know, I'm in a cell by myself. You know? mm-hmm. And that's what prison or in jail are really like. It's like, okay, yeah, there's incidents. But then, you know, the next week or a uh, few months or maybe even a year is just spent, you know, in a cell by yourself. You know, or maybe in a cell with just someone else. You know, this kind of solitary type living. And, you know, it's this hardship of the, the mental anguish that you go through. That's what, you know, prison life is really about. And I think that's important. To, to mention because there are people from neighborhoods that are really violent, you know, because street gangs or maybe people who grow up in domestic violence, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And so when they hear, oh, prison is violent, they're like, well, I don't care. That doesn't, that doesn't uh, distract me or anything like that. My household is violent or my neighborhood's violent. So I don't mind going to prison, you know. I'm used to violence, mm-hmm. right? But if you tell them, well, prison is not all about violence. It's about these other psychological things too, psychological warfare and anguish and all that stuff. You know, it gives people a different perspective of what it is, you know. Mm-hmm. And so maybe you step back and think twice, you know, oh, maybe I won't go to, you know, do these crimes, not just because I don't want to see the violence of prison, but because I don't want to just sit there and, you know, ha- have this uh, overwhelming monotony and boredom all the time. You know what I that's mean? That's right. Yeah. So, and so I think that's important because I think uh, violence is portrayed too much in prison. And really, it's not all about violence. A lot of times it's you're sitting there in a cell or in a dorm just doing absolutely nothing, you know, or just having simple conversations. It's really you by yourself trying to figure out what the fuck you're in here for. You yes, know what I mean? It's a yes. lot of mental uh, challenges in that aspect. And, 
and like you said, physically, man, that's the last thing to me. Like you said, the mentally challenging aspect of prison is a lot more detrimental. Right. Yeah, you're totally right. You say, you know, oh, on one side, you're thinking of why are you in there? It's like, what, where did I go wrong? What did mm -hmm. I do? How come I didn't listen to so-and-so, whether it's your parent or grandmother or, you know, mm -hmm. whoever <laughs> it was? How come I didn't listen? How come I did this? And the second thing is you're thinking of how in the hell do I get out of here? Exactly. That's the exactly. second you're thinking. That's the exactly. two main things you're thinking yeah, of. How to get here and how the fuck I get out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so you're thinking about that. And, you're, and you replay things over and over in mm -hmm. your mind. It's like mm -hmm. something that happens, you know, in real life. Um, you're like, why did I do that? Why did I say that stupid thing? But when you're in jail and you're you're stuck there, you can't leave. You continue to replay that over and over, and, and it can mentally just drive you crazy. That's and right. especially when you're in solitary confinement, like I said, there's nothing else to do, no TV to distract you, or card games or anything. You just have your own thoughts, and it just drives you nuts. So anyhow, and so that was my first experience into all of that, into like I said, hard time and you know solitary confinement. So, I, you know, after that week that I was in solitary confinement, I get out, and mind you, I'm still in county jail fighting my case. And um, matter of fact, uh, it was even harder going to court while I was in um, the hole too because they treat you as more of a threat. So it wasn't just like, you know, you go up in your normal chains. Uh, even if I was in general population, before you go to court, they put you in all kinds of chains and mm -hmm. they put you on the bus and you go to court. But then when you're in the hole, you're an extra security risk, so they also put the, uh, the fetters on you, the ankle cuffs, mm -hmm. you know, and you always have to be accompanied by a guard, like a uh, mm -hmm. close hand and all this kind of stuff, you know. And so it's just more, you know, mental anguish. And guards, they would do like little things to get at you. Like, you don't, things that you don't notice. When you walk, there's this thing on the back of, of your ankle that comes out, you know, and you never even think about it. Mm -hmm. But when you have those chains on, every time you step down, it's like cutting into mm -hmm. your ankles. Mm -hmm. And they I put mean, them extra tight. And they put them extra tight. They, they just do it a little bit tighter, enough mm -hmm. to where you're not bleeding or something, but enough to where it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. really hurting you. Um, speaking of police, the police just drove by. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, and so it's little psychological things like that, you know, and... I, I kind of hate to go on these side avenues, but that's important because there's these little things that they do, and I think that it tries to encourage you to take deals faster to go to prison. You're right. You're like, You're I right. hate this place so bad that I just want to, you know, get whatever. Get the fuck out of here. Get the hell out of here. Whatever time they give me, I'll just take it just so I can get going with my time. <laughs> that's you right. Know, another little psychological thing that they do is in county jail, they leave the lights on in, in the in the all cells night. and the dorms all night. All night. And, and AC blowing. And the AC blowing, yeah, it's either really hot or really cold. Yeah. You know, never this perfect yeah. temperature. But it's these little psychological things that keep you up or to keep you stressing and stuff yeah. like that. And um, and then you have the inmates even telling you, oh, yeah, hey, don't worry. Prison is even better, this and that. And so that even encourages you more so. You're like, wow, if prison isn't this bad, well, I'm going to do whatever I can to get out of here. Like I said, you go to court and they're like, they offer you this many years. I'll just take it just to get the hell out of here. Yeah. And I, I really think that they do that uh, intentionally. So anyhow, so I get out of the hole. I'm still fighting my case. And... Um, I ended up going to another uh, dormitory. No, I went to cell living this time because I'm, I guess I'm a higher security risk now, you know. So they sent me to cell living this time. And I'm doing my thing, you know. Um, I didn't mention this, but while I was there, I played a lot of chess. You know, that's one thing that I did was play a lot of chess. And um, so I'm, I'm in this kind of general population uh, setting. And I don't know if a lot of people know this. Like I said, that there's tables and stuff in this little dorm type area and you can play the chess, checkers and cards, stuff like that. And so one day... Um, I'm playing poker with a few other people and um, there's this other young guy, he's about 18, 19 years old and he's looking at you know, all kinds of time, way more than me, 20, 30, 40 years, something like that. And he's a little hothead and um, he starts going around behind all of us and saying what everybody's card is. And I'm like, okay, this is going to cause problems. So yeah, so this guy, like I said, he's about my age. He's going behind us he's looking at everybody's cards and you know just being a stupid teenage kid he's saying oh so and so has this card this one has this card and i'm getting upset you know i'm trying to play this game of poker i'm getting upset and so i tell him something i, I don't remember what i tell him you know mind you this is 17 years ago this all happened mm -hmm. you know and um i guess it gets him upset enough to where he sucker punched me right inside the face you know it's like my my head was a magnet you know, these days <laughs> for you know punching but yeah sure enough just suck i'm just sitting there you know playing cards whatever and he comes up on the side of me just bam I think kind of like knocks me off my seat too. And he's not the big old dude. He's like a frail little maybe 150 pound guy. But, you know, he gets a good shot at me. So I get up, you know, I start swinging at him. And, you know, we go into fighting mode. And um, he ends up getting the best of me. I mean, he already got the sucker punch on me. But he ends up getting the best of me. But the problem was this guy was as well, you know, a, a Southsider, you know, a fellow Hispanic, whatever, right? And that's a big no-no. You know, uh, in prison, since it's segregated, you know, you know whites, Hispanics, uh, 
uh, blacks, you know, Asians or whatever. It's all about unity, and they don't want to disrupt that unity, you know. And so, if you're fighting with your own kind, that's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, weakening that unity. It's like, hey, you know, you're not, you're supposed to be, if anything, fighting against these other guys. You know, mm -hmm. the other guys, the bad guys, the blacks, the whites, or whoever. You know, you're supposed to be together. They, a lot of times, they consider it like a fist. You know, uh, every individual is like the individual of a hand, like a finger or mm -hmm. whatever. You know, and you're the strongest when everyone's united, everyone's together, like mm -hmm. a fist. You know, and so, you know, the inmate reps of our dorms. Uh, they got mad at him for swinging on me in the first place. One, he shouldn't have sucker punched me. They said, if you want to fight, you know, take it into the cell, be, uh, your guys' selves, and, you know, fight out if you want to fight, you know, told both of us. But you shouldn't have sucker punched him, they told him. So they got on him. And, and the second of all, you know, you shouldn't be fighting each other. You know, you're homies, basically. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be fighting each other. And so after that, um, he apologized. Of course, he knew he was wrong, and he didn't want something worse to happen. I mean, because they could have beat him up or killed him, whatever, for you know disrupting mm -hmm. that unity whatever. and so you know we actually kind of became friends after that he ironically he played chess too so we ended up playing chess together and um we also ended up going to uh, a reception center we ended up going to prison together too we our, our, our cases both got concluded about the same time just so happened and uh, we went to the same reception center reception center for people who don't know that's the first prison you go to when you go into the prison system, it's a prison to find out which prison you're going to go to. They go there, they assess you, say, okay, well, where do you live at? They take that into consideration in case you get visits. Maybe you want to be closer mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. <clears throat> um, just whatever kind of assessment. They look at your crime, what you did, you know, um, what kind of trouble you got into, all this kind of stuff. And so my case in the finishing, like I said, I got seven years, 85%, which is six years. They're like, okay, you know, you got six years, you know. And as a side note... That was kind of relief for my family, especially my dad. You know, uh, that's kind of who I grew up with, my dad and my grandmother. And um, he was just happy to finally know how much time I was going to get. Because, you know, when you go to court, they throw all these big numbers at you. Oh, mm -hmm. you can potentially get 20 years or 30 years. And there's all these enhancements, all this kind of stuff, you know. And so for a parent, obviously, it's very scary. You know, you don't know how long your kid's going to be locked up, you know. It's fear of the unknown. But so when they finally, you know, pronounce that judgment, you know, it's like at least we have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, six years is a long time away, but it's at least we know, you know. And so it was a bit of a relief when I finally, you know, got my time and, you know, went to prison and started doing my time. And they take in consideration how long you were in uh, county jail. And I was in county jail for six months. Mm -hmm. So I had five and a half years left to do in prison. Time. You got that time credit. Yeah, they call okay. it a time credit. Yeah, they call it a time credit. And so off I go, you know, off I go to the prison system, you know, the, the big leagues or the big boys, you know, as they call it or whatever, you know. So I go to reception center. This is in uh, Tehachapi, California. And it was in the wintertime, and it was just freezing-ass cold. I mean, it's like up in the mountains. It's snowing the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's like zero degrees up there. It's freezing cold. You know, I grew up where it, like, barely snows, if ever, kind of like Los Angeles, you know, um, climate, you know. And so that was kind of interesting for me. You know, I wasn't used to all these different temperatures and stuff like that. But, you know, it was also, okay, the rules are more, you know, enforced now. You know, everything is very segregated. It's like... Like I said, these showers are for black people. These mm -hmm. showers are for Hispanics and the white people. You know, um, the area where people play cards and stuff, it's like, it's totally segregated, like right down the middle. It's like this side, all these tables over here, this is where the blacks play cards and chess and all that kind of stuff and watch TV. And then on the other side, it's where the Hispanics and whites do. And you don't interact, you know? And the same thing um, with outside, you know? For those of you who don't know, they have an outside what they call a uh, rec yard. And basically, it's like a football field size area where there is like uh, racquetball courts, basketball courts. Some prisons have weights. Not mm -hmm. in California anymore. There's no more weights. They just have like uh, dip bars and pull-up bars. So anyhow, there's these rec areas. But even that was segregated. There's like one section of workout bars. And it's like, okay, this is only for the blacks. You know, and this one is for the whites and the Hispanics, right? And it was, it was, it's so segregated that it's like, this is for them. But you don't even walk through there, you know? Like, for example, like, say this was the, the, the Blacks workout area, right? Say this is just all workout equipment right here, right? Mm -hmm. If I, I need to get from here to there, I can't just, oh, stroll on through your workout area. I have to go all the way around. I don't care if this is, like, 100 yards long. I have to go all the way around. I'm not even allowed to walk mm. through an area. Okay, and part of that reasoning, it's not just all racism. It's, like, part of the, the reasoning for the segregation is somewhat in safety. It, the idea is if there's not a lot of interactions, then there's less uh, probability that there's going to be a uh, conflict. You know, if I'm never interacting with a black mm -hmm. guy, then I'm probably never going to fight with a black guy. You know, mm -hmm. the theory goes. And so if I'm not fighting with a black guy, then the other Hispanics don't have to jump in and help me or something like mm -hmm. that, right? And so 
if I walk through your workout area, you don't know what I'm doing. You're sitting there getting your money. You know what you're working out. They call it getting money, working out. And um, you don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I'm coming there to try to stab you or mm-hmm. something like that or do anything. You don't know. <coughs> so it's just safer for everybody if I just totally avoid that area. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of part of the, uh, of the reasoning. Whether it's sound or not, who knows? I mean, you could argue that. But that's kind of the reason that they give you is, you know, like I said, you keep it segregated and you, you, you know, um, limit the amount of problems that there could be. Okay, so anyhow, so this was my first foray into that, into like, this is prison, this is how it is, you know. So I'm in reception, I'm only there for a couple months, and that's what it's meant for, you know. Like I said, they're going to find out what prison you're going to go to. So I'm on my way up north in California, like I said, to a whole different land. You know, California is a big state, and um, so, you know, everything's different up north, not just weather and stuff like that, but especially in the prison system. And this is where uh, it starts to get in the north and south, uh, as far as Hispanics are concerned. It's not like with the blacks or, or with the whites per se, whereas there's uh, some unity throughout the whole state. Mm-hmm. With the Hispanics, they divide it into north and south, a little bit of central too. And it's called uh, either Sureños or, norte- or Norteños. I'm not really good with my Spanish. Uh, either south or north. And um, it's like two big divisions uh, or divisions of gangs you know it's like if you're from any kind of gang or even if you're any kind of resident in southern california then you belong to these you know southern hispanics if you're from any kind of gang in the northern part of california or resident of the northern california mexican person then you know you're represented uh, you're representing the norteños right but the conflict is huge intense uh, i mean it goes back you know decades i don't even know maybe the 50s or before that or whatever and it's so bad that in certain prisons, it's like, you know, on site. If you're a South Sider, I'll just call for South Siders, North Siders from now on. If you're a South Sider and you even just see a North Sider, they call this uh, like, take off on them, mm-hmm. you know, at sight. Take off means, you know, either beat them up, you know, stab them, whatever. It's the, the conflict is so bad, so tense, that if you even see one of these people, you have to attack. No them. questions asked. No questions asked. We don't care what your reason is. We don't care what your you know family's doing. Nothing like that. You don't care about your personal life. Nothing. You hmm. see these people, you take off on them. You know, you attack them, right? And so I'm headed up there into that territory where it's like that. You know, uh, in prisons in Southern California, it's mostly you know people who live in Southern California, and so there's not that um, conflict between Hispanics. Hispanics are united. Mm-hmm. But you get up there, and now all of a sudden, these people who look like you have similar tattoos. You maybe similar haircuts as you. They're potentially your enemies. And so it's, 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 it's totally different mindset, you know. Um, it's like having an enemy who wears the same uniform, you know, because they're Hispanics as well. Like I said, they look like you. They might have a shaved head or you know, whatever, just like mm-hmm. you, you know what I mean? And so you might not know who they are or see them coming because you think that they're one of your people, you know. And so I'm headed to a prison where it's like that, you know. And so there I go. And so the prison I go to is uh, called Soledad, Soledad Prison. I think there's a couple prisons up there. Uh, the, the whole prison system is called Salinas Valley State mm-hmm. Prison or something like that. There's a newer one and then there's an older one that's been there since, I don't know, 30s or something like that. And that's where I went to the older prison. It's got um, three tiers, uh, you know, cell living and stuff like that. And so I go there. And sure enough, less than, I think less than a month, maybe even like two weeks of being there, a riot kicks off between the northern and southern Hispanics. Um, what had happened was, I think one of the, the northern guys, he was walking around without his shirt on and exposing his tattoos and maybe walking around with bravado or something like that and it pissed somebody off and they were like hey we're gonna you know go to war with these people fight them you know and <laughs> go the guy to, wearing no shirt over the guy wearing no shirt you know and like i said uh, showing bravado or whatever and it's like okay you know there's no like oh i don't want to fight or whatever you're part of this you know southern hispanics whatever when it jumps off when you know the fighting starts happening you gotta jump in and that can include you know not just beating up but you know stabbing or getting stabbed or um the officers, you know, there's ones who are in like a tower, they always have guns. The ones on the ground, they have like pepper spray. And so, you know, there's potential uh, to get hurt or injured from all these kinds of different areas. So they're like, this is gonna happen. They're like, we're gonna, you know, go to war with these people. So sure enough, uh, we're sitting on the yard and um, it's about a football field size yard, maybe a little bit bigger in width. And on the opposite side, they just start to go at fighting. I don't know if there's stabbing going on, whatever, right? And our job, you know, as Southern Hispanics is as soon as it happens, you get up, you run over there and you help your, your fellow people, you know. And so, you know, I get up, I dart over there as quick as I can. So does everybody else. You know, we're over there working out and stuff like that. And um, it's funny, about halfway over there, it's already getting coiled within like maybe 10, 20 seconds. 
as we're still running <clears throat> over there, we're still trying to get over there, and they're already like laying on the ground. And as a side note, in prison, when something starts to happen, the first things that guards do, they have like a PA system where they address inmates, and they'll yell, they'll yell, uh, yard down, yard down. And that means one of two things. One, you either get down and you sit on your ass, or two, you totally prone out. You mean you lay face first on the ground. That's what they want you to do. And anyone who doesn't do that is subject to getting shot or pepper sprayed or whatever. And so we're running across the yard, and... Um, the guard has like a big old, like a super soaker thing of pepper spray. And he's telling us, get down, get down. He just started spraying that thing like it's nobody's business. And so I turned to like block it from hitting my face. And um, I get down on the ground. But in the meantime, it hit me like on my side of my face, my ear and all right here, right? The whole riot thing, whatever happened, it's already over before I even get like yeah. halfway there. So I didn't, yeah. But it doesn't matter. You know, just the fact that I was going to be involved, that was um, enough for them to think that I was an aggressor or whatever, right? So everybody's laying on the ground, everybody's proned out. They go, the first thing they do is searching everybody for weapons, stuff like that, and they're looking for knives. And if some, any, and anybody gets uh, killed, especially, it's just like uh, you know, a crime scene in real life. Homicide unit has to come in and you know, they section off the area, all this kind of stuff. You know? And I think, sure enough, someone did get stabbed. And so you know, a uh, section gets quarantined, they look for weapons, all this kind of stuff. So we're sitting there laying down, proned out for like hours on the yard as they're going around individual by individual hey you get up they search you strip mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. bend over squat and cough and as a side note the reason that they have you do that is because sometimes people stick weapons or drugs or whatever up their anus <laughs> for hiding spot they use their anus as a hiding spot yeah it's funny but I don't think they ask us about that like how they could have put a knife in their ass i said you know there's ways there's ways uh, i don't know how graphic would you want me to be <laughs> but from my understanding i never done it but apparently if you squat down and your your butt opens up enough and you put it in there and just like suck it up i don't know that's what they told me <laughs> i never tried it never want to try it so anyhow and so that's why they tell you to bend over and squat and cough i guess when you do that if anything's in there it'll either poke out <laughs> or shoot out yeah i know it's it sounds gross and imagine as a side note imagine if that's your job if you're a corrections officer and you have to ask another man hey bend over squat and cough you know you go to work that day you know you don't you're not want to see all that you know so anyhow um oh, so yeah so that's happening you know individual by individual they're they're going through Looking their, buttholes. seeing buttholes smelling buttholes all that kind of stuff you know and um they eventually rile us all up and now it's time to take us off the yard because now we're a threat to, you know, institutional security. They round everybody up and like I said, it's time to get off the yard because everyone who's involved in that ride, they, they, you know, they have to investigate now. You know, they have to question people, see who is going to talk, who's not going to talk, you know, who got stabbed, why they got stabbed, who's fighting, all this kind of stuff. You know, the guards have to find out, you know. And anybody immediately they found was aggressor, whether you're running over there like I was or whether you're actually beating up somebody or stabbing somebody, automatically you go off the yard, you know, your privileges are being taken away. You know, anything you have, being able to work out and, you know, talk to people mm -hmm. and this and that, they're taking that away. No more TV, no more playing chess or anything like that. You're going to uh, segregated uh, housing now. And that was the first time I went to that. Um, it's called the SHU. For those who don't know, SHU is S-H-U, short for segregated housing unit. And it's pretty much literally what it sounds like. Um, as it already is, like I said, on mainline and general population, it's people will segregate themselves. You know, you're in a cell, if you're Hispanic, you're in a cell with Hispanic, you're black, you're in a cell with black, so on and so forth, right? Um, and it's like that in the shoe, but as well, when you go to the recreation yard, that is as well segregated. It's not like you go to a yard with everybody, you know, it's, there's not gonna be black stuff out there. When I go to the recreation yard in shoe, it's only gonna be Hispanics. If you're in the shoe, you know, you're black in the shoe, mm -hmm. you go out there, it's gonna be all black, <coughs> and, you know, in your little yard. And that's a mild privilege, because when you're in the shoe, 23 hours and 45 minutes of the day, you're in your cell. You get 15 minutes every day, 15 minutes out of 24 hours, where they actually let you go out to this little, not a football field size yard anymore. Now it's way reduced to like maybe a quarter of that size yard. And so you got 15 minutes and you pretty much, you work out that whole time, you know, um, especially for the Hispanics, right? It, we're up there in the north, like I said, it's like a battleground. And so they wanted us to keep fit all the time because it's always a potential, you know, for uh, a fight or danger or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. Even though everything is segregated, the guards may, you know, accidentally or intentionally, you know, open up a cell of, you know, one of the, the northerners and he could come out in and attack you. And you might just have, you might be chained up and he's in a cell without chains. He comes out, he could start, uh, you know, stabbing you or something like that. And so you need to be physically fit as you can. That's the mm -hmm. mentality, you know. And so the whole 15 minutes we're out there, we're working out, you know. And then when you come back in the cell, like I said, that 23 hours and 45 minutes and you're in the cell, 
a good portion of that you need to be working out um and there's no you know there you don't have weights or anything like that and so you're doing push-ups or things like burpees and sit-ups and stuff like that mm -hmm. and as the south siders we had an additional restriction of we weren't allowed to sleep during the daytime so as, the, as long as the sun was out i think from like six in the morning or something like that all the way to nine or ten at night we weren't allowed to take a nap or anything like that so it became psychological too because just in case the 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 reasoning was just in case our cell door gets popped and some northerner or whoever comes running in there, we need to be up and ready with our shoes on all mm -hmm. day to be able to fight, defend ourselves or whatever it is. And so for, you know, my entire uh, shoe period, which was uh, three months, that was my, you know, my, my daily uh, ritual or routine. You know, you get up, you eat. They, in prison, they feed you three times a day, uh, two hot meals, breakfast and dinner, and one um, cold meal, like a sandwich for mm -hmm. lunch. And like I said, you go out for 15 minutes a day, you work out like crazy doing push-ups and things like that and burpees and running in place and all this kind of stuff. And then you work out in your cell. And um, <clears> that <throat> kind of goes back to what I was saying. You know, people think, because uh, they watch movies, they think that the majority of prison is violence. And that's just kind of more proof to that, you know, um, that one day some violence happening, you know, even if I was involved in it, whether I was <coughs> or whatever, the con next consecutive three months, was no violence you know it was just uh, psychological being in the cell and working out and stuff like that and that's one of the things i noticed when i was watching the video with the guy who did 17 years he kind of like uh, brushed uh, glossed over that a little bit he was talking oh yeah i did a shoe term for a year this and that you know but that was 365 days out of his life i only did three months that's 365 days out of his life that he was in that cell every mm -hmm. day 23 hours and 45 minutes a day you know what i mean just psychological uh, uh you know anguish you know like like we're talking about you're thinking about mental warfare mental warfare with yeah. yourself you know um things are gone going on outside this was one of mine um at the time my dad he became diabetic and um had all kinds of heart problems he was dying you know well you know he could potentially die and so you're thinking about all that and that you can't do anything you know when you're out here on the street as prisoners call it, you know in um uh, you know, you have freedom. If your dad or your mom's sick, your brother or sister, whoever, you go see him, you go hold him, comfort him, give him a hug, something like that. But when you're locked up, you're in that cell and you can't do anything. You know, maybe you could write him a letter, hey, I'm sorry you're feeling like that, but you can't just go, hey, give him a hug and say, you know, I miss you, you know, I love you, I hope you get better. Nothing like that, you know? And so that drains on you. That night, you may not even get to talk to him because you can't use the phone when you're in a shoe, you know, at mm -hmm. all. There is no phone use. And, you know, what if, you know, your mom or dad or whoever died that night, you know, or the night before? You didn't even get to talk to them or say goodbye, you know. And so these are all things you're talking about, you know. A birthday might happen. You don't get to go to that birthday or, you know, a friend's party. Nothing like that, you know what I mean? And these are, um, these are the real hardships of prison, you know. And these are things that they don't really talk about in the movies because it wouldn't make a good movie you know what i mean what is the craziest thing you've seen while you were in prison what is the craziest thing i've seen um as far as like violence i never really seen direct violence it always seemed to happen at a distance like people were stabbed on the yards i was in but as kind of a side note you don't see you're not supposed to see anything this is one of the first things i was taught that, that you know it's not like in high school you know if a fight starts happening what happens all the kids run over there like oh what's going on <clears throat> In prison, that's a no-no because they say that that's silently telling on the people. If two people are fighting and you're going over there looking, all these heads are looking over there, that's showing the guards, hey, there's a fight over mm -hmm. here. So you, you, dry you're, snitching. you're dry snitching, they call it. You're indiscriminately telling on that person. And so if you do see something out of the corner of your eye, someone getting stabbed or beat up, you mind your own business and you keep on walking. You mm -hmm. don't stop for a second to stare, to look, to ask questions. You keep on with your business. And so when they ask you, you know, what do you see in prison? Technically, you don't see anything. Even if someone's, if I'm sitting here right next to you, you know, you could be my homie. And all of a sudden you start getting stabbed. It's my best interest just to walk away and yeah. ask questions. Yeah. I don't know why they're stabbing you. I don't know if you owe money, if you're a child mm -hmm. molester or something like that. And so my best interest is just to walk away and not ask any questions. You know, they're stabbing you for a reason. It's not my business. You know? mm -hmm. Unless, you know, you're getting stabbed by another race, then I help you or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it's my own race, stabbing one of my own race, there's something wrong with him. I don't ask questions, you know. And so the craziest thing I've seen, it's hard to say, um, it's more so, I don't know, the craziest thing I guess I, I've been through was kind of the, some things I've seen. Like one of the craziest people I've seen was this guy in county jail, and he was in a red jumpsuit. You know, general uh, population inmates are in orange. Um, the trustees, the ones that, you know, are allowed to go out around and work, they're in blue. You know, so you see stuff like that. You never see anybody in red. Red means high power. That means 
their, their crime was something severe. They either killed a cop or something like that. I ended up finding out this dude chopped somebody's head off. Mm. Literally, I mean, you know, this is a whole different level of crime mm. here. Not just, you know, went and had bank robbers. Chopped somebody's head off. The whole whatever else he did, you know what I mean? And um, he happened to be in the hole with me. He, the, the red suits, they're in um, solitary confinement all the time. There is no general population. And so he was basically sentenced to the hole all the time. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was his regular program. And so that was one of the craziest um, things, I guess, you know, just totally a, a different experience. You know, as 18 years old, you don't really think about stuff like that. Did know? you have any interaction with that individual? Or? A little bit. He was kind of crazy and he would like try to, I don't know, I, I can't explain it, like try to get my attention. He would try to talk to me. Manipulative? Like, like kind of manipulative <laughs> type of things, yeah. And I would try to watch out because I'm like, you know, this guy is, you know, different level of crazy. And so <laughs> yeah. I had to be careful what I said. You know, if he tried to fish for information, Oh, you're getting a visit. Oh, who's coming to see you? You know, oh, stuff yeah, like that, yeah, you know, because yeah. who knows what this yeah. guy is thinking, you know, totally, diff totally different level of, I mean, because I've seen killers. I've seen people who shot two, three people. You know, I've seen bank robbers, everybody from drug dealer all the way up to, you know, multiple murderer. Mm -hmm. But he was the only person I've seen who actually did something uh, that severe, you know, so that mm -hmm. was kind of one of the craziest things I've seen, you know. Okay. Yeah, totally different level of criminal, you know, and not no kind of, you know, fraud or anything like that. You yeah. Know? Other than that. The only crazy, like, I guess, physical thing that I seen was, um, this was way later on, you know, I ended up transitioning to a, a lower security prison, a level one. And even though it was a level one, you know, that means you get more freedoms, basically, is what that means. And Solid Dad was a level... Uh, Solid Dad was a level three. Solid okay. Dad was a level three. And then the shoe is kind of like uh, NA level, you know, I mean, there's no, you know, it's not specified, you're just, you know, locked up all the time. Anyhow, so, uh, later on, I was, ended up transferring to a level one. I'm kind of skipping way ahead. And, um... Homosexuality in prison is kind of taboo, especially with the, you know, Southern Hispanics. Um, it's even more so Southern Hispanic if you're a gang member, you know, it's like you just don't do that. I mean, it, it, you just don't, you know, it's there. It's not accepted, especially imagine this was 17 years ago, uh, you know, between 2000 and 2006 when I was locked up, you know. And uh, it's not like nowadays where it's very accepted and, you know, a lot of things are more accepted nowadays. You know, it's like, no, you just don't be homosexual. Right. So anyhow. Uh, a Hispanic guy came in and he was kind of like openly homosexual a little bit, but he wasn't part of the, the, the southern car, mm -hmm. so to speak. He was, uh, they, they call them Pisces. It's like Pisces mm -hmm. are like people who are from Mexico or, you know, they're like Mexican, Mexican, not gang member Mexican, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Okay, so he was like that. I think he might have been Cuban or something. He might have been another Hispanic. So anyhow, he was kind of openly gay, right? And whatever happened, he ended up getting involved with a southern uh, Mexican person in some kind of homosexual foray. Mm. And that's a no-no. And so next thing you know, um, you, like I said, you're in the dorm and you don't see things. But all of a sudden, you, you hear stuff. A lot of times you hear stuff. You know, all of a sudden you start hearing like thumping or you hear feet scuffling around. <laughs> yeah. And that usually means someone's fighting or getting beat up or something. That's kind of an indicator. You know, yeah. you could listen without, you know, giving Seeing anything away. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you heard that all of a sudden you hear scuffling of feet and, and beating up and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, something's going down, right? And so next thing you know, the, you know, the cops run back there to find out, the, the deputies run back there to find out. And um, the, the actual gay guy, he comes out somewhat uh, unharmed. You know, the guards pull him out and he might have a couple scratches. And then they carry out the southern Hispanic guy. I guess they were checking him, telling him basically like what happened to me, but more severe. Like, you don't do this. You know, like they're telling me don't trade with the blacks. They're saying you don't commit you know homosexual acts and they basically beat him to a pulp they, they they had to carry that guy out of there i mean he was like bloody from his head down that was one of the craziest things i seen up front as they were carrying that guy out and you know like i said uh before you, you go into prison and you're not you know racist or whatever it can make you racist you know uh if you go into prison not homophobic Something like that can make you homophobic or at least step away. I don't want anything to do with that. Someone mm -hmm. comes to you, like if that guy would come to me with some kind of homosexual proposition, I don't want nothing to do with it, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the craziest physical things of someone's getting harmed, you know? And it was just another realization. Even though I was on a low security level one, violence can happen anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was a perfect <clears throat> sign of that, so. And so while, while you were down, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, I know you went from solid dad and then to a level one. What, what okay. was, what'd you do to try to prepare yourself mentally for when you did get out, you know what I mean? So that you had something to at least, um, to try to fall back on. Right. Okay, well, I had a lot of time, you know, I had six years to do that. And from Soledad, you know, um, I went to Ironwood State Prison, which is another level three. And um, that was kind of my uh, 
transitioning a little bit into the mentality, okay, I'm eventually get out and, you know, a few years and this and that. Even though it's a while away, you still kind of think about it, you know. Um, and then there, as a kind of a side note, there was a lot of lockdowns. See, um, this is an, uh, uh, a thing that happens nowadays in prison. This is one thing I'm talking about. Talking about the violence thing. In, in movies, they portray, like I said, violence a lot, right? And maybe in the older school prisons, it happened a lot. Something violent would happen. Either someone would get stabbed or killed, you know, on the yard. Mm -hmm. They would take those people away. Whoever was involved in that, and then the yard would go back to normal program. Okay, the, we took the, the instigators off, but everyone else, you're not involved. You go back and do mm -hmm. what you're doing, right? That's kind of the old school uh, mentality. The new school mentality was, even though the small group people, it kind of just be two people fighting. They lock down everybody. They you don't care if you're involved or not involved. They take everybody, get back in your cells for an indefinite, indefinite amount of time while they investigate, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They want to find out who was involved, what, what races were involved, all this kind of stuff like I talked out, uh, about before. And it's because of that that there's not a lot of violence. Like I said, one small violent thing would happen. It's like, okay, you guys can't get along. Even though your race might have not have totally been involved, lock down everybody until they figure out what's going on. And so it could be weeks or months, or I heard on some level four is it even up to like a year where you're just stuck in your cell day by day, kind of like the shoe program. You're not able to go out to the yard or to the day room to play chess or anything like that for long extended periods of times, you know, like a week, months or, or, or whatever. And so, like I said, that's hard time. That's a uh, uh, real prison. And even more so, even if violence did happen, so say we're locked up for like two weeks. Say somebody just got into a fight. Two guys got into a fight and they're like, okay, everybody get in your cell. You're locked down for a couple weeks, right? Okay, so two weeks later, we get out. Sometimes it would seem like as soon as you walked out of your cell, they would be yelling, yard down, yard down. Someone in another building already. As soon as you know, we come it's out. It's on and cracking. It's on and cracking. Yeah, someone's already getting stabbed. Maybe somebody owed money because of gambling or people, someone didn't pay their drug debt or something like that. Something totally didn't have had anything to do with you. Now all of a sudden, everybody's locked down again. You just got <coughs> out from like two weeks of being locked down. Back right back in your cell. Mm. And you know, so that's the reality of prison. Yeah, violence does happen. But the, since the new thing nowadays with prisons is to just lock up everybody, it, it reduces the amount of violence. The, uh, with a, the idea with that is if everyone's in their cell all the time, not a lot of violence can happen because there's no interactions happening. Again, mm -hmm. with that whole no interactions happening, no violence happening. And so it was a lot of that. A long period of time, I don't want to jump over it, but that's what it was. Long periods of time where you're just in the cell, you know, and not doing anything. And then, when, like I said, when you come out, you know, I play a lot of chess or maybe cards and stuff like that. So anyhow, eventually, um, when you do good in prison, um, you, there's a point system in prison. You know, higher points you have, the higher security prison you go to. Lower points, lower security prison. And if you're doing good, you're not, you know, getting in trouble doing drugs or whatever, your points start to drop mm -hmm. uh, per the institution. And so your points get to a certain level, okay, now you can go to a lower level prison. And so eventually mine went to a level two and eventually a level one, where mm -hmm. I was at, the level one where I saw the thing with the homosexual guy. And that was where I spent my final three years. And that's when you really start preparing. It's like, hey, you're on the level one now. Um, you get a little bit more freedoms. It's all dorm living. And um, they have more things. That's where I actually got my GED from. They, mm -hmm. they have programs where you could, uh, you know, go to college. You know, um, you know, they send you the books and you do all stuff through the mail and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, yeah. So that's when I began to finally transition towards getting out. Thinking about, okay, when I get out, I'm going to have to need some kind of education. And I'm going to need some kind of skills, this and that, you know. And the lower levels, they usually give you jobs, whether you're working in the dorm, cleaning up, or some uh, people even get to work outside the gate, like cause, uh, where I was at, Chuckawalla Valley State Prison, it's in the desert. So some inmates were actually able to go outside the gate, and they'd be raking rocks, as they would say. I don't know what they did out there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you rake rocks, you know, you do the uh, landscaping for the prison, this and that, you know. So you get, like, real freedom jobs. And um, so that's when I tra started to transition, you know, like I said, I... I went got my GED. I tried to go to college for a little bit, but so much of the stresses of prison and psychological things, I just couldn't focus. Um, but it was also uh, trying to transition to, you know, not just what I'm going to do to make money, you know, how am I going to interact with people and this and that. And um, this where it gets into, um, you mentioned one of your videos that your favorite movie, uh, prison movie is Shawshank Redemption, right? Mm -hmm. And mine is too, because that's one of the few prison movies that I've seen that talks about where it's not all about violence, it talks about other things. Um, you know, like sometimes they show the guy just sitting in the cell doing nothing, or him and the, the guy uh, talking, or hey, do you play chess, stuff like that, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Other things happen besides violence, right? And one of the things that I remember Morgan Freeman was talking about um, was there was one guy in the movie, the really old guy who was locked up for like 50 something years, mm -hmm. and when it was time for him to parole, they finally granted him parole. And he was going to stab another inmate because he didn't want to go. He had been there so long, became institutionalized, mm -hmm, as Morgan mm -hmm. Freeman said. And 
that's how it really is. That's one of the reasons I love that movie. It's, you know, every day that I was locked up, every single day, I wanted nothing more to get the hell out of there in any way that I could. You think of, you know, what could I do? If, could I be a better inmate? Whatever. You want to get the hell out of there, right? Mm -hmm. But then when it finally starts coming time to go, you, you get within, you know, a year and then a couple months and maybe a couple weeks, it starts to get scary. You know, you really, you start to get you know, butterflies in your stomach because... You know, you know, all these expectations are going to come. And sure enough, you know, you get out and all these expectations come. You know, um, prison life, it's like, okay, for one thing, I wanted to mention this. One thing, you never get touched by anybody in prison. You know, in, in real life, you know, you might go to a party and your little nephew or whatever might come give you a hug. Mm -hmm. Or your aunt might give you a hug. Some form of affection. Some form of affection. A lot of touching in real life bumping into people in the subway or stuff like that or in public places you're at mcdonald's whatever you get bumped in mm -hmm. in prison that never happens one because it's all guys and there i said there's that homophobia you know and so uh, touching is kind of taboo and two people don't like getting touched because it's like you know if i go put my hand on it's like why are you putting your hand on me are you trying to brace so i could uh stab you or whatever mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's like don't touch me you know i even noticed that uh with guys who came from the level four sometimes they come hey how you doing they'd be like whoa 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 what are you touching me for you know what i mean because they were so used to it. someone's getting touched they're getting mm -hmm. beat up or stabbed or something like that. And so in prison, there's no touching. And then you transition from that into real life where there's a lot of touching. Like I said, people want to hug you and kiss you. Hey, how you? I haven't seen you so long. You know, in public, people bumping you and scuffing your shoes and all kinds of stuff. And it's this um, overwhelming, um, like, stimulation. It's a stimulation overload, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the beginning of it. And the second stimulation overload is all of a sudden you have all these responsibilities. The second thing in prison that you never hear talk about in uh, movies or anything is in prison there's no responsibility you know you don't pay bills you don't cook your own food unless you work in the kitchen you don't cook your own food you know um you just sit in a cell all day they bring the food to you or maybe you just walk to the chow hall your meals are prepared for you you don't think about what you're going to eat you know all this kind of stuff right but you get into the real world and all of a sudden it's like okay well what are we going to eat for dinner where am i going to work so i can pay this gas bill and electric bill and all this kind of stuff you know what i mean mm -hmm. all this responsibility responsibility overload and it's funny, you want to hear a, a funny story. One of the weirdest things that I, I seen when I was out, I started working at um, Red Robin. It's a hamburger place. And uh, I was a busser, you know, and so I go around and I noticed this guy. He had like uh, tats and stuff like that. And I could tell he had been locked up before. And when did you, was this after you got This out? was after I got it. I was, I was working at Red Robin. I was busing. And um, like I said, I noticed this guy had a uh, prison tattoo. I could tell he had been in prison before. And uh, one of the waitresses went to give him a menu. And for a split second, you know, I kind of went into his head and I was thinking, because in prison, they don't ask you, oh, hey, what would you like for dinner tonight? Or, you know, what would you like to eat? It's just they tell you, you know, a menu comes out every week. This is what's going to, you're going to get Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's what's going to happen. And so I wanted to go talk to him and say, hey, isn't it so weird that, you know, someone's actually asking you now, hey, what mm -hmm. would you like? Because, you know, it, it, it's just that experience. It's, it becomes so foreign because it just in prison it never happens. You know, things so many things are done for you that 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 little experience like that becomes foreign. So anyhow, I, I jump forward a little bit, but um, and so, you know, in in a level one transitioning to to go out, you know, it's preparing you kind of try and prepare you for all these things. And I even have I think maybe uh, uh, classes that that's part of like when I was going like to like pre-release classes. Pre-release classes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of the GED is trying to prepare you socially for things like that. They they try to tell you, hey, things are gonna be different. You know, there's gonna be children out there. That's another thing. You know, there's no children in prison. There's no pets in prison. You know, did you no... get any visits while you were in prison? Yeah, yeah. I, I gloss over that, but. Um, Big thanks goes to my dad. He visited me throughout the whole time. You know, my dad's the one who I grew up with. And, you know, whether he was sick, like I said, he had congestive heart failure and diabetes. He's going through so much stuff. And he still made it out at least like once a month. Whether I was way I'm up big. north, yes, very big. Whether I was way up north or way out in the middle of the desert somewhere, you know, he would make a point to drive out there and to see me, you know. And so, yeah, he was uh, very helpful in me making it through prison and eventually, you know, uh, uh, doing well, you know, uh, making it outside of prison. And um, yeah, and he would come into, I, I'm backtracking a little bit, a lot now, but yeah, when he would come to visits, it was nice, you know, being able to see him and give him a hug and this and that. But as a side note, um, when I was doing my shoe program, when he would come to visit, it's no contact visit. So everything was behind the glass, you mm -hmm. know, and that was very uh, emotional time for us because, you know, I didn't get to hug him and, sorry, <laughs> but that was hard. But um, yeah, you know, you don't see him for months and then when you see your family, you want to hug them, embrace them, you know? Oh, sorry. 
So was he a big, as far as huh. like when you, when you got <laughs> out, was he um, a big supporter of you to help you get yeah. on your feet? So I want to talk about that though. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cry, but it's, but that's how emotional it is. You know, um, you're so deprived of, like I said, the touching and everything like that, mm -hmm. that you kind of crave it a little bit too. And, uh, you know, on one side, you're like, you don't want people touching you, but uh, other side, you know, you want to at least embrace somebody because it, it, it is, you know, there, like I said, violence is all the time, but there is violence and there's just so much negativity in general in prison. Mm -hmm. And so when you get a visit, when people get visits, they even uh, done studies and they notice people get visits tend to do better in prison as not get mm -hmm. in trouble and even after prison. It's because it's like a little bit of a relief from all the insanity of prison. So anyhow, so, you know, when he would come, you know, he'd travel all the way up north and, you know, I have to see him behind the glass. And, um, but when I eventually got down to the other prisons and I was able to do the contact visit, it made it better, you know, able to hug him and kiss him. And you're able, there, you're uh, able to buy food for the prisoner, you know, so he was able to buy food for me from vending machines mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I remember vending machines were big. Yeah, vending machines were big because, you know, on a daily basis, you get really bland food from the prison. You know, they give you potatoes and rice, things that have, like, no flavor. You know, they don't add salt or anything. But in the vending machines, they have, like, Hot Pockets and, you know, mm -hmm. Dr. Peppers and stuff like that. And that would be one of, my, my, one of my favorite things. He'd buy me Dr. Pepper and stuff like that. But, yeah, he came all the way up into the end. Even when I was getting close to release, he still made sure he came that last month to visit me. And, you know, talking about stuff, hey, this is where you're going to live and stuff like that. And one of the biggest changes that happened, well, two big changes. One my uh lifelong dog i had a little dog um growing up and it passed away after like 15 years and so that was one of the hardest things because when i got locked up i had my dog and when i went back home he was gone you know and the second thing is my family did a big move um we moved far away from you know where i grew up and so that was a big thing too it's like hey you're gonna come home but it's not gonna be you know anything you recognize i had never been to this city before and you know it's a new house all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. And so they're, you know, they were preparing me that way, you know, and it's like, you know, this, you're going to live with us and this is going to be your room. And, you know, my dad said, you know, we're setting your room up, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, you know, in the prison, they prepare you, you know, for work and stuff like that. But my family is trying to prepare me for, you know, you know, this is the social functions we're going to go to, family parties, and all that kind of stuff, you know. And so they try to prepare me for that. And then, um, you know, my friends were like, hey, we might be able to get you a job. And that's where the Red Robin thing ended up mm. um, coming in. One of my friends ended up, they knew a manager at uh, Red Robin. They got me a job there, and I worked there for about a year. Um, and so once I'm out, you know, um, now, and like I said, all of a sudden there's this overwhelming responsibility like everything you know little things that you know you don't think of you know what kind of shoes are you going to wear you know in prison it's the same thing every day you know uh we had chanclas uh flip-flops you know mm -hmm. that we wore you know it's the same blue and you white socks stuff like that but maybe you chose oh well, i want to wear you know my black shoes or my blue ones or stuff like that or a hat or not a hat or it's things like that you know mm -hmm. there's a lot of options in real life and in prison there's not a lot of options and so it could be very overwhelming you know the stimulus you know all these options people throwing stuff at you Hey, when are you going to get a job? When are you going to have children? You know, um, are you going to come to this party or not going to come to this party? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Someone's birthday is coming. Hey, you have to get them a gift. Oh, if I'm getting a gift, how am I going to get money? I mean, just a lot of stuff. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it can be overwhelming to the point where going back to um, Shawshank Redemption, I think that was what they were trying to portray with that old man. He got so used to, for him for 50 years, me only six, you know, for him for 50 years or the guy that you interviewed for 17 years, you got used to basically no responsibility or very little mm -hmm. responsibility, you know, and then you get out and all of a sudden it's like, you got to do all this, you know what I mean? Um, hey, you got to take care of your kids. And I mean, just overwhelming responsibility and it could be overwhelming on yourself, you know, and I think that's what causes so many people to go back. You mentioned this in one of your other videos, the recidivism rate is very high. That is mm -hmm. how many people go back to prison after coming out. It's not because they like violence or drugs or whatever. It's because they don't know how to function in that new life. You know, what used to be their regular life on the streets now became foreign to them after being locked up for And so that's many years. a big mental factor because, like you said, it's not so much the physical. You can get out on the street and beat up people all day, but mentally, you might not be able to cope. Yeah. You know what I mean? With right. the day to day. I mean, that's the, that's the big thing when you do such a long stretch of time is being able to adjust back to normal life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's crazy, man. And that becomes incredibly difficult. So how's, how's your life now that you've been out for a while? You know, how do you, how do you, you know, what does your day to day consist of and how do you cope with like this day to day relations? Right. Um, well, that was one of the hardest things was like coping, um, with all the new stuff. Like I said, with all the overwhelming stimulus, um, you know, I spent a lot of time locked up or confined or not doing a whole bunch. Like I said, I played a lot of chess, just sitting around, not doing a whole lot, maybe work out from time to time. And so when I got out, I didn't have like a drive to do a lot of stuff. I didn't have like energy to do a lot of stuff. So I just wanted just to sit around and do nothing, play video games or just 
do like very minimal stuff, you know. So it was hard to push myself to, you know, to go out in public just to look for a job. And there's a lot of uh, discouragement because one, you know, uh, places don't like to hire ex-felons, you know. And so even when I did go out to look for work, you know, it became more and more discouraging every time they turn me down because, and I, you know, they don't say, hey, we're turning down because you're an ex-felon. But, you know, I mean, I thought about it in my head, you know, say a, 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 an employer gets like 100 applications. The first ones they're going to throw out are the ones that say, you know, been convicted <coughs> of a felony or mm -hmm. something like that. They want the ones where people have college graduates and all this kinds of stuff, you know, experience. And when you go to prison, it's not just you have the prison experience. That past six years of my life, I don't have any work experience. I can't say, oh, yeah, I've been working in, you know, the prison kitchen. I mean, that one gives myself away. I've been, work in, I've been in prison. And two, it's like, oh, good, you've been working in prison, you know. Mm -hmm. They want real life experience, you know. You're working somewhere in the real world, you know. And so that's one thing that hurt the most. I can't even imagine for the guy who was uh, locked up for 17 years. That past 17 years, he has no work history. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing, you know, <laughs> especially in a good job. They want to know where your work history, for, not just for the past five years, but 10 or maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. They want to know what you've been doing. And he had nothing. You know, I had nothing. You know, and so that was hard. You know, I would go out there and try to, you know, hit the pavement apply after apply after job and um nothing you know people would continue to turn me down and also the big uh, one of the biggest transitions was technology that's one of the things that flipped me out the most remember when i got uh, locked up in 2000 it was all about pagers PC, we had pcs in the house but it wasn't that big of a thing you know and i get out all of a sudden little kids have cell phones that was the one of the weirdest things i seen was a little kid have a cell phone nobody had cell phones in mm -hmm. 2000 when i got locked up and I, it's all about pagers and stuff like that and um even applying for a job, you know, in 2000, or even you know, when I got my first job at 16 or whatever, you know, I walked in there, I filled out a piece of paper, and I got a job that day. Oh, hey, you want to work? They went and got me a uniform in the back. I started working that day. But now, you know, jump forward 2006, it's all about, oh, no, we have to do this uh, background check. And they do psychological evaluations, ask, you know, all these kind of psychological questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, what would you do in this, you know, scenario or in this instance? Say someone coming up to you and started yelling at you, you know, like a whole list of psychological questions. And online, that was the other thing. Um, applications started to be on the internet, and I wasn't used to that. Like I said, when I got locked up, it was paper applications. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it was this whole different world, a whole more te technological world. Uh, going back to um, that movie, it was like when that guy got out, when he, when he got locked up, there was no cars. And he got out, all of a sudden there was cars buzzing around mm -hmm. everywhere. And it's just more overwhelming stuff, you know. And so that made it hard to transition. I had to eventually get a phone i had to learn how to you know go online and apply at jobs and all that kind of stuff and i and i was lucky that i had you know a friend that would inevitably help me get a job at red robin and uh, but even when i was there at red robin i didn't know how to socially interact with people um you know from you know basically since i became an adult because i got arrested when i was 18 so my whole adult life thus far had been in prison. I learned how to be raised in prison, not trading with blacks and, you know, not uh, interacting with homosexuals, all these kinds of stuff, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so I didn't know how to even talk to like my coworkers or to, you know, uh, customers or whatever. All my interactions seemed like strained. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to joke about, you know what I mean? Um, I didn't know if I was being too rude or profane and this and that, you know. And so no matter where I went, to the mall or at work or whatever, or even at family parties, I would kind of just sit there, kind of like a loner, you mm -hmm. know. You know, I hadn't been there for the past six years watching kids grow up. I didn't know anything about their lives or their history. I didn't have anything to talk about. And so all this stuff, you know, sometimes you get to the point where you start, as crazy as it sounds, you start to miss the prison life. You got so used to that life. You became institutionalized, like Morgan Freeman said. It's this crazy thing where, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. You hate this place so much, but you get so used to it that you, you don't know how to function outside of it. And that was the thing. I didn't really understand how to function outside of prison. I knew how, I, you know, when I came, when I first came to prison, I didn't know how to function. I didn't know mm -hmm. about not trading with blacks and all that kind of stuff. But over the years, I did. And you get into the routine, you know, I have my routine, you know, you, you know what to do, what not to do. You know, like I said, you don't have to worry about paying bills or anything like that. And you get very used to that sedentary lifestyle, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't know how to function in real life. And that was one of the hardest things for me is I had to learn how to be an adult, you know. Even with some guys who got locked up later on, say in their 30s or 40s, they had already lived their adult life. You know, they had apartments on their own, this and that. I never had that. I went from being a kid to being uh, an adult in prison, you know. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I never had my own apartment. Or I never had to pay a gas bill or a lecture bill or anything like that. When I got locked up, I never paid that. Maybe some of my money I would give to my parents and they would pay the bills, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, and so I had to learn all that stuff. And it's very overwhelming. When you, you know, every time you get the mail, you're getting all these bills and, hey, you better pay. We're going to turn off your electricity. 
stuff that you just don't have to deal with when you're incarcerated. You know, things that you don't think about, you know what I mean? So what do you do now? I mean, as far as what is a, a day-to-day -day for you now consist of? Right. Well, um, I'm unemployed right now. I, I was working at a gas station. I ended up getting fired from a gas station. And that's one of the things I've had, for me personally, I've had such a hard time just trying to find my groove is I've been in and out of jobs since I got out. You know, I got out in uh, 06, so what was that, 11 years ago. And it has been hard for me. Like I said, I don't know if, like, if it's because, like I said, I never became an adult in real life. I became an adult in prison. And so I just never learned how to be an adult in social relations and work. You know, sometimes when I do work, sometimes it's hard for me to um, take crap from customers and this and that. You know, because I, you know, when I was in prison, you know, I grew up, someone's talking crap to you or whatever, you just unload on them. You just beat mm -hmm. them up or whatever. And being in customer service, for example, you can't do that. You have to sit there and take some of that shit. Oh, hey, I'm mad because my gas wasn't pumping right or my burger, burger's wrong or something like that. And oh, hey, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. This and that, you know, all that. And I, I wasn't used to that. And still, it's hard for me. It's hard for me just to be that humble. I try, you know, I become very humble. But that's one of the hardest things for me. When your boss is sitting there breathing down your neck, you're like, you want to just say, well, fuck you and your job. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what you want to say. And so having to restrain all those emotions, you know, and, and that physical stuff, it's still hard for me, you know. I mean, I do it, you know. I don't just, you know, f fight random people or whatever. But it's just the conflict inside of my head. So, yeah, now I have a kid. Um, he's about to be three years old. So, you know, I had a kid about three years old. And um, that's been a challenge too. Like I said, you know, in prison, there are no children, period. There are no animals. There, are, You know, it's, it's all adult men in prison, except for, you know, some female guards or whatever. And um, so you get used to interacting with only adult men. And then you come out into this real world and there's children, there's pets, and there's, you know, all these kinds of things. And you have to have a different level of patience. You mm -hmm. have to have a different level of patience with children than, when you, than you do with adult men or than you do with women. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my, this is my day-to-day -day, is still trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with, you know, a kid, you know, my kid when he's crying or, you know, um, my girlfriend when we're in an argument or something like that, you know, I can't react in my own ways that mm -hmm. got me into prison or got me into trouble, into fights and all that kind of stuff, you know, and I don't know why it's so embedded in my head, but so this is my day-to-day uh, -day struggles and kind of an odd struggle that I have. Um, like I said, I played chess a lot when I was in prison and it's weird because, you know, they have the, the cell areas or bunks, and then you have like the day room, like I said, where you go play chess and cards, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I got so used to playing chess. You know, I love playing chess. You know, I play every day, you know, several games a day, you know, thousands of games over the course of, you know, my six years, right? And when I got out, I still wanted to play chess, you know, as a social activity. And I found out, well, it's not like prison where, you know, it's right there. You know, the, the chess tables are right there. I go play. I have to, you know, call up place. Hey, does anybody play chess there? Go, you know, drive maybe... 10, 20 miles and try to look for a place. And so it became incredibly more difficult just for to have a social activity. And so oddly, I became to cr crave prison life for that simplicity. I, I liked, you know, just being able to get up in the morning and walk, you know, 10 feet to a table and play chess, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And the fact that I couldn't do that anymore or other simplistic things, you know, it was kind of frustrating, you know? Like I said, in the real world, there's responsibilities like driving and, you know, working and all that kind of stuff, or even having to go out of your way to go play chess or go play baseball or something like that. The yard is not right there, you know. You may have to drive 50 miles to go play with your buddy's baseball or something mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it was just that difference. It was hard for me. And so sometimes, you know, like I said, a person becomes so institutionalized, you begin to crave the simplicity of prison life. People, because I, I hear that question a lot, they were like, why do people go back to prison so much? I hear that asked a lot, you know, in political commentary and stuff like that. And I really think it's, that's one of the reasons. It's because, for one, it's simple to commit crimes. It's much harder to do, you know, the nine to five, going to work every day. You know, I have an uncle. He's been a mechanic for like, I don't know, 30-something years, right? And he gets up like 6 o'clock in the morning. He drives really far and goes to work like 10, 12 hours. You know, that's hard to do, right? It's easy to go buy a gun for 10, 20 bucks and go rob a bank. You know, it takes maybe 10 minutes or something like or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's easy to, make, to commit crimes. And I think that that's one reason why people go back to prison, one of the reasons is because people, the people who do are just lazy. They're too lazy to want to go to work every day, to get up at six o'clock, to force yourself to get up at six o'clock in the morning or nine or whatever it is, you know, and to do that routine. Or when their kid starts crying or, you know, um, they start arguing with their old lady, they don't want to deal with it. And so they just resort to violence right away. They don't want to maybe sit down and talk to their kid or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to go out to the bar and just drink beer. And then they go get into a fight or something like that. That's easy to do that. It's easy to go drink beer or smoke weed and get into fights and sell drugs and do all those things, you know? And so 
Um, that's one of the things that as an ex, anyone who's an ex felon, you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to overcome that because it's tempting. It's tempting to want to take the easy route. It's so much easier to go sell drugs in a park or something like that than to be like someone like my uncle who, like I said, goes to work, you know, 10 to 12 hours every day. If you're a construction worker to be out in the blistering sun all day or something, like that, that's not easy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, you know, and so that's my struggle. And I think a lot of inmates struggle. And that's why so many people come back, uh, go back. And I've just been very fortunate to where I just haven't, you know, I've, I've restrained myself enough to where, you know, I at least make enough money to pay bills and to not commit crimes and stuff like that. And so anyhow, that's that's one of my main struggles. It's just still tr trying to deal with real life, you know, adult life. And I just I think my big my biggest problem was I was just never prepared for it. I went from being a kid, like I said, uh, on the streets just to my first years of adulthood in prison. And I just never learned how to be an adult. So having been through what you've been through and, um, you know, dealing with the struggle that you face, mm. what would you tell, you know, ex-cons out there? What advice would you give them in order to get out here and, and try to be successful and not go back to prison? Because I know it's been a struggle for you to try to get on your feet. Right. Um, well, first, before we even get to that point, for all those people who are not ex-cons yet, who are potentially out there committing crimes and, you know, basically on your way to going to jail or prison, I would say, you know, one, just be aware of what you're getting into. Like I said, first of all, prison is not just all about violence. Be prepared for just just absolute mental anguish and, and boredom. But if that's what you want to do, you know, if, if uh, you want to just continue to commit crimes, you know, people are going to commit crime anyways, um, you got to be prepared for, you know, what's going to what's gonna come. And um, part of what's going to come is the general thing in prison is you can't do what you want with who you want and when you want, you know, you know, just this conversation that we're having here, because we're different races, I couldn't do that in prison. I couldn't sit at the same park benches as, as you, you know, uh, in, in the same situation, but in prison. And so if you're a type of person who you have, you know, multiracial friends and this and that, you're not going to like that. You know, you're not going to like all of a sudden you can't talk to your, you know, to just a, a, a black person or maybe a Hispanic person or a white person or whatever it is, you know. And you can't just, in the middle of the night, say, say you know, 12 o'clock at night, I get up, I, ha I have a hankering for something to eat. I could go to In-N-Out or McDonald's or mm -hmm. whatever I want. I could get a hamburger. In prison, you can't do that. Like I said, you can't go where you want, do what you want, when you want. You know what I mean? It's all about, they give you uh, what they want to feed you, you know, um, when they want to feed you. Uh, you have to do what they tell you to do, whether it's the guards or other inmates. You know what I mean? You just, you don't have freedoms, you know? Um, a party might come up. Oh, hey, so and so, we're having a party over here. You would come over. If you if you have freedom, you can do that. But when you're locked up, you can't go to those parties. Like I said, you can't go to the fast foods. You can't interact with people. You know, I, you know, in prison, I can't just w walk up to a black person. Hey, how you doing? Oh, you don't feel good. You know, or maybe you're hungry. I could give you some food. You know, in prison, you can't do that. You know, maybe you're a somewhat kind-hearted person. You don't mind sharing with other people. Like you know, like me with the the black guy whose pants didn't fit him. Oh, yeah, it was a little bit of kind heart in, in myself, just trying mm -hmm. to trade pants. I felt bad. He, his pants were too short, you know? So you're forced out of kind heartedness in a prison. And so if you want to become this, you know, hardcore, you know, uh, no feelings person and you don't, if, if you don't like going out to eat and going to parties and you don't straight up, if, if you're a guy and you don't like getting pussy and all that kind of stuff, then go ahead, go to prison because you go to prison. There's no women in there. You like women, then don't go to prison. If you like going out to eat, then don't go to prison, you know, or jail or whatever. Stop committing crimes because that's going to happen. You might think you're this, you know, unbelievable criminal. You're never going to get caught. Well, statistics say odds are you're going to get caught eventually. And all those privileges that you have, being able to go out here in the park, I can go from here to there if I want, wherever I want to want to go. I just travel like over 100 miles to come here. And I'm having a great time, you know, but you can't do that. You're going to be stuck in a, in a little cage like a dog. If you want to be stuck in a cage, then go for it. And now if you're an ex-felon, you're getting out and you're either about to get out or you are out and you're trying to transition and maybe you're going through some of the things, uh, like I said, and it's hard for you. You know, one thing you're going to have to stick, stick uh, through it. It comes down to either you do it, you know, you do well, or you're going to go back to prison. You know, if, if you're on parole, <coughs> You know, and they're telling you do this and do that. You're gonna have to do it. You know, if they say keep your house clean, don't have any knives or guns or whatever in the house. I don't care whose it is. Don't have it in the house. You know, and um, you're gonna have to take shit. If you, almost any job you have, you're gonna have to deal with people. You know, uh, not all jobs are customer service, but you're gonna have to deal with a boss or you know one of your coworkers or customers. And sometimes people are gonna piss you off, and sometimes people are gonna make you mad. You know, sometimes 
your old lady or if your husband. Oh, as a side note, um, I noticed you guys haven't interviewed any um, female prisoners either. And that's another thing. You know, I'm talking about to the female ex-cons out there too. You might get a husband who pisses you off, you know, or maybe your kids uh, make you mad sometimes. And yeah, it's easy to go back to drinking or doing drugs or doing whatever you want. And so you're going to have to overcome that within yourself. No one else can stop you from doing all that. You know, people can advise you, but you could sneak out in the middle of the night and do drugs or drink or, you know, commit your crimes whenever you want, you know. And so you're going to have to overcome it within yourself and say, hey, I don't want that life anymore. I don't want to be back in that cage and having those people tell me what to do all the time. And in general, if you don't like people telling you what to do, you know, when to shit and telling you to bend over, squat and cough and all that, then don't go to prison or don't go back to prison. Real talk, mm -hmm. Matt V. You know, fresh out, we keep it real. We try to bring you guys some real interviews and see the struggles and what's going on in life. And, um, you know, hopefully this, this hits home with some people and you guys can um, take note and, um, you know, educate yourself because uh, ain't nothing fly about prison.